All right, so let's talk about genre bending. Hold on. <laughs> awesome. Can that just be the, the video this week? Yeah. Just cut everything else out. Being fucking disgusting. I'm really sorry. <laughs> I feel like... God. It's been a week. It's been a week. It's, it's been, been a week. How, how are you guys? Well, I'll say this. Uh, I still have glitter on my body from last night. <laughs> no! <laughs> so great. <laughs> oh, my God. What did you do? Um, I, I, Joe and I, uh, a friend of ours invited us to this really, really, really fun, um, just like classic dance party, awesome DJ playing everything that makes you want to dance. My feet are killing me right now because I'm uh, in my 30s. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but we had such a great time. Uh, there was a lot of glitter. I don't know what the, you know. The thing about glitter is you never know where it comes from. You just wake <laughs> you wake up the next morning. And you're like, oh great, there's glitter everywhere. It's um, the which is why I'm saving you from my bloodshot eyes this morning. So um, you know, wow. you're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, how about you, Zachy? What'd you do this week? Um, <clears throat> well. <sighs> I th uh, I started out the week with um, no I've been having an ear ache in my right ear for sorry um what the past week <laughs> now I get like really bad ear aches usually like once a year and they're really really painful and usually I just go to the doctor and they take that huge syringe and they just like pump water in my ear um and this time has that have you guys never done that it's horrible it hurts so bad. <laughs> What like doctor are you going to? The doctor, it's because they're trying to like get the extra wax out or whatever, but they put a little cup under it and just keep shooting saline water into your ear. It hurts a lot. But anyway, so I woke up on Tuesday and I had like a sinus infection, a really, really bad sinus infection, which I've never gotten until I moved to Connecticut, fucking Connecticut. Um, and so this is I... This the story that you want to share with America this morning. Yeah, this is the story. I got two, actually. So. Okay. Buckle up. Um, so I woke up with sinus infection, went into work for two hours, then had to go home because I was looping out. Like I was starting to get like, not delirious, but I was starting to get like blah, blah, blah while I was sitting at my desk. So I came home. Um, Michael, <coughs> thankfully, had antibiotics left over from his sinus infection, so I took his medication, which is very safe. Recommend everybody to do that. Um, we'll share so, everything, including come, I know, right? <laughs> we share everything, uh, tell each other every every secret we've ever had. Um, so I'm getting over a sinus infection that was really, really horrible and painful. And then yesterday, I think it was yesterday, um, I was getting ready to go to um, one of my meetings, and Michael was playing a video game, and he had the hiccups, and so I came up behind him. I don't, I don't know. What, uh, whatever. So I came up behind him and went like, ah! right yeah. in yeah. his face. But I guess I was a little close to his ear, and he jumped and got really mad at me, and just kept screaming like, "Get away from me! Get away from me!" And I was like, "I'm so sorry," but his hiccups went away. So, <laughs> so it was all worth it in the end. It was all worth it in the end, and now we're stronger than ever. I love it. Can you write that in an essay? Yeah, I will. I will. Thank you, Kate. <laughs> I have been traveling. I got to go to Quebec with um, a pack of middle school children to chaperone them. Yes. I was not like in a human trafficking ring or something. Did you take a bus? Yeah. Eight-hour bus ride. It was gorgeous all the way up. It was gorgeous when we got there. Um... And I got a lot of reading done. It was awesome. very awesome. And I finished a new book. This is backwards, but Joyce Carol Oates, Black Girl, White Girl. I'm probably going to review it on the blog this week because it was cool. fucking so good. So, yeah, uh, it was a great trip. Had you I been before? To, uh, no, it was first time. First time I've ever been. First time I've ever been to Canada. And um, Did you need yeah. a passport? Yeah. Yeah, you need a passport. Didn't used to, but now you do. But I mean, customs was fine, you know, because we weren't smuggling heroin or anything. Just kids. 
Just kids. <laughs> just, just, traffic, just trafficking some kids. It's really <laughs> nice. So, yeah. So that was um, a very inspiring trip. And I'm actually taking another one tomorrow morning at like 5 to California. So um, all of that will come back in the blog this week. I love it. Here we go. Colin, what do you, what do you have to say about crossing genres? Um, I think um, everybody does it, and you shouldn't judge. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, and done. Well, I, <laughs> um, I, I think it's, it's, it's a really, really great topic for anybody, any writer to consider. I mean, and, and, and the idea is, you know, not to pigeonhole yourself into, you know, saying, like, I'm a fiction writer, I'm a novel writer, short stories, essays, poems, uh, to see it kind of like as a continuous spectrum that, you know, you can... Mm -hmm. Um, dive into and out of at, at different points in the spectrum. Um, one of the quotes I love is uh, from one of my mentors from Fairfield, Kim, who um, who mentors um, what she calls prose writers. She doesn't really differentiate between fiction and nonfiction. Prose is prose. Um, you know, if you're writing a nonfiction story, if, even if it's like a if it's more narrative or more essayistic, it often has to follow some of the same narrative rules as fiction. Um, and even if you're writing fiction, if it's if it's about you know realistic people, um, those people have to seem real, even if they're made up. So it, it's kind of like you know just different sides of the same co coin to me. Yeah. Yeah. No. Absolutely. And um, for me, when I was thinking about this topic, I was thinking about authors that sort of cross genre, but I was also thinking about the way I use different genres in my life, I guess. And I used to write really shitty poetry, so I guess Zach and I had that. <laughs> that one. Um, but I still do. But now when I'm having, because, you know, I write pretty much exclusively fiction unless I'm doing, like, blog stuff. But if I'm having trouble getting started or getting motivated, I pick up a book of poetry and just read a couple poems, and that sort of gets me in the framework of writing. So it's... Yeah, it's these skills that, that transfer between the different genres. It doesn't matter what genre you're writing in or reading. It's, it's going to inspire you if, you if you get yourself into the place where you're looking at some kind of literature on the page. So for me, I like use a different genre to sort of get my creative juices flowing for the other stuff. Interesting. And I actually did that for the first time uh, this past residency in, in, a, in a winter workshop. Um, working with uh, Caroline Davis, who is, you know, this um, star poet, um, working through an essay that had kind of stymied me at the end. You know, I, I, I sort of knew what it was about. I knew how to approach it, but I didn't know how to end it. And uh, she suggested, why don't you just write the ending as a poem? Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, because it's an essay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I did, and it was... Oh my gosh! I can't even tell you how helpful it was. It, I think that, um, yeah, I think poet. I mean, I'm not. I don't want to speak for everybody, but for me, poetry can be a little intimidating, um, you know, because it's it's this sort of um, often elevated language and uh, and really a different um, sort of uh, protocol of thinking. You don't think in the same way as, as as you do in prose. But doing that actually helped me with this essay, and in fact, I incorporated some of the poetic lines into the end of the essay. Hmm, um, now, in my thesis, so it all comes full circle. <laughs> yeah, I feel like it, jumping genres, like, it sort of makes you, it kicks you out of the, the rut you might be in, because you're, you do, like Colin said, you have to think in a different way. Even if it's fiction to nonfiction, you can't really make shit up anymore, so maybe you find yourself being more honest and then you can bring that honesty back to your fiction because you know yeah so it's it's good to it's good to jump around a little bit i love the idea of it being a spectrum of genres instead of little boxes because i think that's true there's a lot of room even between fiction and nonfiction for interpretation yeah what well, about you Jack? well one of the things that um, when we first uh, brought up this topic I thought about was this book called Lying, a Metaphorical Memoir by Lauren Slater, which the first words that she writes are, I exaggerate. And I thought that was so interesting is that this is a genre bending that is not like an experiment in 
you know, helping her writing so that she, I, I think, I, I might be wrong, uh, but she's a pathological liar or something like that. Like, she, like, has some, I don't know, whatever. But that pushing that line between nonfiction and fiction, which Colin, because we're nonfiction writers, I, we, Colin is so much better about, at it than I am, but, like, dialogue, like, making up dialogue, not even making it up, but you know what the dialogue was, but you obviously don't know the exact words, but you know that you have to get from point A to point B, and you have to put that that bridge in between those two points. And something like dialogue, you know, how, what rights does, you know, each genre have before it becomes another genre? In fiction, you know, what someone in our program is writing a nonfiction book, but just calling it fiction. That, I mean, then technically it's not fiction. I mean, it's nonfiction, with a fiction filter. So it's it's that type of... I think that that type of genre bending that I, I find really interesting because it's it is almost not... It's not intentional. It, it's not meant... Yeah, it's not it's not meant to help the author or, or students or whatever, you know, experiment with the writing. That it, It's more of, you know, what else could they do? Like, this is what they're supposed to be doing with the writing. Well, that, and that's, that's a great point. I think you, what, you're, what you're saying is that it's, it's actually built into it. You right. know, um, when you write fiction uh, and somebody tells you this character isn't believable, you can't tell them, well, I made him up. It doesn't matter if you made him up. He, ha he has to be real. Right, right. Um, and... Um, the thing that helps me, uh, Zach, w when I write nonfiction, you know, with like stuff like creating dialogue and so on, is just keeping in mind, um, and I had to kind of like learn this and get into this room of, of, of mind, that the minute you write anything down on the page that's nonfiction, the minute you create yourself as a character, you're engaging in artifice. So yes, there's kind of a open question of you know how much artifice you can engage in when you write nonfiction. Right. You do have a contract with with the reader. Um, but I think Lawrence Slater is such a great example because um, that contract to me, um, whether it's fiction or nonfiction or even poetry, um, all it says is I'm going to be straight up with you. Okay. Mm -hmm. So even if I'm calling this nonfiction, I'm going to tell you that I made I made parts of it up. Mm -hmm. uh, Sonia right. Huber's book uh, Over Nobody is also a great example. You know, it's it's mm -hmm. um, a book about um, tracing some of her family history, and the parts that she was not able to. Um, ascertain with certainty through research about her grandfather, she just tells the reader, and this part, I'm just going to imagine what it was like for him, you know? Mm -hmm. It's still nonfiction because she's telling, she's being straight up with you. Um, it's right. uh, what I call the Paul Abdul of writing. <laughs> 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 and, you know, fiction, how you were saying before that, you know, in fiction we can't just be like, oh, well, I made him up, so that's why you don't believe him. Right. People also, you know, I, th I think in fiction and nonfiction, they they feel like just because a person was real or just because something did happen, that they don't have to make it sound believable. Right. So I think fiction and nonfiction have a lot of the same issues um, making believable characters, because you know it's not it's not just about that they were that they happened. Mm -hmm. It's about are they believable on the page? You have to make them believable and relatable. And dialogue. Because, Zach, you were talking about how you have an issue getting... Like, you know where the dialogue is supposed to get people. You know where the dialogue is supposed to motivate the story. But mm -hmm. getting point A to point B, because you don't really remember all the words or whatever, or how much license you can take, that can be trickier. It's the same thing for fiction. Right. Like, as you were saying that, I'm thinking, yeah, dialogue is really hard to write. Because, yeah, hard to write. because you have to get a story... There's a you don't just have dialogue for no reason. Mm -hmm. So when you have dialogue, you have to get people from point A to point B. You know what needs to be in the conversation, mm -hmm. but you have to make it good and right. readable and cut the stuff that doesn't matter and highlight the stuff that does. So it's, yeah. Well, that's what I, I do that every fucking time in dialogue where I'll be talking about a conversation with, like, my mom or something, and I'll say, you know, like, how are you? I'm good. Okay, okay. Like, I don't need that shit, but I put it in, I'm like, it happened. And, it, and, I, I and sometimes know. you do need it. Sometimes it is uh, just a way of saying, wow, right. this is a really ordinary, uh, right. unremarkable conversation, and, you know, mm -hmm. you're showing that. Right. Yeah, so, yeah, I think the skills transfer, and mm -hmm. if you can get outside of your genre and try something different, like... Um, like Hollis Seaman's book that I just I read for the blog and reviewed, I have never really read a YA book before. Right. And it was a completely different experience, but it was still 
a great book. It was it was a great story, and I had sort of written off YA, but it was, it's just so good to get outside your genre and get outside the the boxes you kind of create for yourself because it's all writing, it's all creativity, and it can all um, influence your work. So don't sell yourself short as a one genre, one trick pony, people. Right. Well, I think also another, uh, another just so we can kind of bring poetry in here too, because. I didn't talk about it at all, but yeah, yeah, there's a really great... Like, um, we need a poet up in here. But anyway. Right. I'm t I will not take that crown. <laughs> um, but one of the... When I was, you know, doing poetry in the program for the semester and a half I was doing it, <laughs> um, one books. Bill Patrick uh, gave to me was The Ghost Soldier by James Tate, which is a... It's... To me, it's it's prose poetry. So it's it's all prose, but it's poems, and it's it's absolutely wonderful. But I, what I think I more want to concentrate on is with poems, at least to me, when I'm reading a poem, I my immediate um, assumption is that it's nonfiction, that it's true poetry, and that, like, I, I would love to find <clears throat> poems that are nonfiction and fiction, that it's, <clears throat> excuse me, I think it's actually kind of strange that we do nonfiction, fiction, and poetry, because it shouldn't be prose and then poetry or prose, but you know what I mean? That it's like poetry can be Absolutely. non fiction. Absolutely. Yeah. Sure. And you know, the idea of when people, when people hear or, you know, say I'm, I'm writing a memoir, I'm reading a memoir, you assume it's prose. Mm -hmm. um, but I think Bill, Bill himself has written a memoir in, in poetry. We didn't right. come here for this. Yeah. So it's, I, I think great example. Yeah. Yeah. And prose poetry, great example of genre bending. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You look at it, it looks like a paragraph, but then you read it and you know that it's not a normal paragraph. And I think that's, prose poetry is a great way for people like us who write prose mm -hmm. to learn how to infuse our writing with the, the lyricism of poetry. Mm -hmm. Because those are not normal paragraphs when you read those. Right. Um, Lindsay, one of the editors for Spry, um, she, her, po her poetry, I loved her poetry because it's prose. But she has this really cool, like, song and beat. Mm -hmm. And, like, it's almost like slam poetry that she kind of, like, hits, like, a lot of different genres. And that I always found really intriguing and really interesting because it wasn't... I mean, I, I love regular regular poetry, meaning where, you know, it's A, B rhymes and, you know, two, two stanzas, things like that. Um, but hers was just really, really kind of this, like, Frankenstein's monster of... Poetry and it was awesome. It was always so good, um, and I think that I, I I feel that it's we're coming to more of that type of writing in you know the writing world is that it's not really black and white anymore. Poetry, nonfiction, fiction that we're really getting into like the visual text blog I did. Those are becoming really big, and you know doing the prose poetry, doing um, like uh, what Colin did on the end of his essay, like poem in the end of. Uh, of an essay like that that's not becoming extinct I think that's that's so yeah I mean, because you know to K talk about like putting ourselves in boxes I mean I think a lot of those boxes are created artificially uh, you know just to sell books most of the time right. uh, but when when we when we sort of take ourselves out of those boxes we realize that uh, what we are are like we're creative animals and that you know we can use um, multiple outlets for our creativity mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm going back to the example of Bill, Bill Patrick, who um, writes um, fiction, uh, nonfiction, poetry, screenplay. Right. I mean, and they're all, it's all storytelling. It's all him, you know, being creative and um, engaging the reader and in, in, in the way that he thinks is appropriate for whatever story he's telling. So right. um, I think if you take yourself out of those boxes, you, you sort of open up new creative worlds for yourself. And, I, you know, don't, like Kate said, yeah, don't limit yourself. Yeah, right. and I, I love that that's happening now, and I love that genre is becoming a spectrum and not a right. series of boxes. So get out there and try something different, people. You know, and and that's the great thing. You can just try and, and fail, as Colin said in his blog, and, you know, you might learn something new. You might learn a better way to phrase a sentence, or you may find you're really good at a different genre. Don't limit mm -hmm. yourself because now the world is exploding with hybrid literature and um, new genres that, I mean, everything's accelerating with the internet. So right. we're seeing new genres and new combinations of genres and people just aren't scared to try things, you know, mm -hmm. and it's great. It's wonderful. 
Yeah. So take a risk, y'all. Take a take a risk. <laughs> Just do it. Just slogan. Are we allowed to say that? Is that taken? That should be our slogan. Just do it. <laughs> it is now. <laughs> I just copyrighted I got it. it. <laughs> um, so let's talk about what's going on in the blog this week. We got a writing prompt tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and speaking of creativity, um, on Tuesday I want to write about the idea of whether you can or cannot teach creativity. It's come up like a couple times um, that book that people were talking about, MF, uh, MFA versus NYC. Yeah. Um, it came up a lot in that, so uh, I'm going to talk about it. So Great. read about it. Great. And then on Wednesday, because I'm a world traveler, I'm going to talk about setting in a story. And then on Thursday, I'm going to talk about um, writing someone else's story, whether... Um, I'll leave it there because I need to make sure I have everything for that blog post before I start rattling <laughs> off about it. Yeah. <laughs> and then Friday we'll, have a wrap, Friday we'll have a wrap up, maybe a book review, and then Saturday we'll, have we'll a... try to get another guest blog, maybe. Yes. Yes. Yeah, Sam's blog was so awesome. Thank you, Sam. Yeah, yes, thank you, Sam. And if Girl you'd Sam. like to write for us, yeah. let us know. Boy, Sam, we're waiting for you. Boy, Sam, yeah. We're, we're, we're going to hook that up this summer, I promise. Or we could do Abby Cleland. She has another movie coming out. Does she really? Yeah. All right. All right, you look mad about it. No, I am mad about it. You super jelly? Yeah, because I want her money. <laughs> I'm just jelly of her. I want her hair. Am I right? I want her hair. I want to just... I, it's going to sound I wanna bad. I want to like her no, whatever you cut it off and put it in a plastic bag and put, sleep with it. Colin, whatever you say about her hair is not as weird as what Zach and I have said because I said I wanted to twirl it on a fork and eat it like spaghetti. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Doesn't it? It looks like delicious spaghetti. That's like such good spaghetti. Hi, Abby. Hi. Love your hair and love your hair. Hair and your movies. So. And you. You should come in, and you, of course. We sh you should come in. Oh right yeah, in. we like you too. I love that brain under that beautiful head of spaghetti hair. Do you think she comes at like Marsha Brady, where she goes like ninety eight, ninety nine? No, I hope she combs it with a dingle hopper. No, I think she wakes up and sings Beyonce. I woke up like this. I woke up like this. Anyway. All right, we are so off topic. All right, so Saturday. Love it. Hopefully, we'll have a blog post. Facebook, um, Twitter. Yes, share Instagram. us. Facebook. <laughs> oh, my dad. What, I talked to my dad this week and um, he said I don't, fuck what was I saying something about like I always say like follow us or something it's like oh you should totally get people to like follow you on Instagram or something and I was like funny you should say that Colin says that every episode every single show have Instagram. <laughs> they should follow us on Instagram well we have Instagrams I'm, and I'll post that on underneath the blog each of us have an Instagram I think I haven't used mine for about three years. They don't really use theirs, but I use mine, so I'll share mine. Mine, is, uh, I'll share mine is not safe for work. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Colin, NSFW. All right, so, yes, follow us on, on uh, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. Mm -hmm. I will post our Instagrams because Colin keeps saying it, so I might as well <laughs> do it. Um, I've been peer pressured into making us share our Instagrams. So and Pinterest, you have to pin us. Yes, pin us on Pinterest. Oh my God, we're so ridiculous. And All right. Abby, send us your hair, damn it. <laughs> Abby, Abby Cleland, send us a bag of your hair. <laughs> oh God, this is just going off the rails. We need to end this. Okay. Have a great we'll weekend. Edit that part out, right, Kate? <laughs> what? We'll edit that part out. No. <laughs> you know, I always say that and I weave in the ridiculous shit. So I'm not going to make any promises about editing that out. All right, everybody, have. <laughs> Zach dying. Have a great week. Abby, send us your hairs. <laughs> Cheers, everybody, and we'll see you next Sunday for another ridiculous episode of It's Just Brunch. Cheers. Cheers. Bye.